Gifford High School is a chamber of history, vibrant culture, and success. An institute that is now close to reach a century. It has concocted men who have been able to grace our community with roses of advancement since 1927. Every student that has set their foot in this school of technical excellence breathes triumph and always blots the very concept of failure from the mind. A plethora of names in well-respected circles and companies tag Gifford as the origin of their success stories. How many times have Giffordians shown the force of a bee swarm? Can one outlast the sting of true success and excellence? The school was established in 1927 as the Bulawayo Technical School, led by Mr. Philip Henry Gifford and four teachers, with an enrollment of 39 pupils. The school's name was later changed to Gifford in honor of Sir Henry Gifford, whilst it also moved from Plumtree Road to settle to Pleasant Day Matopos Road and 16th Avenue. Philip Henry Gifford, whose energy and personality was largely responsible for bringing the school into existence and shaping its successful evolution, little is known of his life before he came to Rhodesia. He was born in the British Embassy in Tehran, where his father was a member of the embassy staff. He took his degree in science at the University of Manchester. During the Great War of 1914 to 1918, he held a commission as commander in the Royal Navy and served as a destroyer at a naval engagement in the early months of that war. His contact with the Navy stamped his character and personality with an indelible mark. Mr. Gifford was tall and thin, almost to the point of being scrawny. He played tennis, golf, and squash. Before coming to Rhodesia in 1923, he taught at a school in Ireland and in Edinburgh Institution. He joined the staff of the Salisbury Boys High School before it received its present name of Prince Edward School, became its vice principal, and was appointed to be the first headmaster of the Bulawayo Technical School on January 1927. He was well endowed for the tasks ahead of him, and he gave it his full spice and capability. Unstintingly, he had a marked talent for getting to know the leading people of the town and he gained their sympathetic interest in the school. Mr. Gifford was no tyrant, although he did not suffer fools gladly. He was broad-minded and patient. He taught mathematics throughout and put a high value and mathematical ability in boys, seeking it, bringing it out, and cultivating it. He believed that every boy should be taught something. His classroom style was very forceful, and his lofty use of the word dolt applied to an unfortunate boy slow in replying to a question was long remembered by the boy. Mr. Gifford put a high value on physical activity for boys, and from the beginning took the lead in developing organized athletics, rugby, cricket, boxing, swimming, water polo, and in time, gymnastics as part of a boy's education. Under Captain Farrell, the cadet corps achieved a high level of efficiency. While all this was going on, the school was thrusting forward in respect of numerical strength and academic and public esteem. One by one, the headmaster's plans matured. A new school building was opened in 1929. 
high school status was won in 1931, and the bait hall was presented by the Trust in 1933. As the years went by, there were flowed from the school a steady stream of young men with good general education and a firm interest in the prospect of a career in a technical profession. Mr. Gifford gave up his position in 1947 on promotion to chief inspector, and before he left, he had the satisfaction of seeing many of his old boys occupying positions of great responsibility in the manufacturing industry, transport, mining, personal engineering enterprises, architecture, and in the building. Thus, the educational experiment of 1927 was justified, and the dedication of 20 years of the headmaster's life made evident. The greater part of Mr. Gifford's out-of-school happiness came about as a result of his marriage in 1932 to Miss Gladys Terry and from his son and daughter. Mrs. Gifford was a source of strength to him and thus to the school throughout their married life. She is remembered for her readiness to be at his side at public functions and on school occasions and for her grace and charm at all times. On his retirement, Mr. Gifford was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire. He died in 1962. He was, by any judgment, a man of outstanding stature with a singleness of mind rarely met with. He and a very remarkable headmaster. Southern Rhodesia, then a self-governing colony of the United Kingdom, entered World War II along with Britain shortly after the invasion of Poland in 1939. By the war's end, 26,121 Southern Rhodesians of all races had served in the armed forces, 8,390 of them overseas, operating in the European theater the Mediterranean and the Middle East Theater, East Africa, Burma, and elsewhere. The territory's most important contribution to the war commonly held to be its contribution to the Empire Air Training Scheme, under which 8,235 British Commonwealth and Allied Airmen were trained in Southern Rhodesian flying schools. The colony's operational casualties numbered 916 killed and 483 wounded of all races. The soldiers that were recruited included old Miltonians and Gifordians who showed spirit of patriotism. Unfortunately, Africans have been grossly and underrepresented in official histories of World War II, so how many went underpaid more have been forgotten altogether during the war. Some 15,000 African soldiers lost their lives fighting for Britain. Cricket. There were very few senior schools in those early years. Milton, Blumtree, and the technical school in Matebeleland. Prince Edward and St. George's in Mashonaland. Chaplin in the Midlands and Umtali in Manikaland. Traveling was not easy. Indeed, a visit to Plumtree was an adventure in itself. The train was the only practical means of transport, and the regularity of arrival far from guaranteed. Many will remember, often with mixed feelings of nostalgia, the home-shattering corrugations and the nights spent stranded by the low-level bridges as one waited for rivers to subside. 